Uh, Te technically, just to let everyone know, you are interviewing me. Like, although the switch is the screen is switched. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing the interview on this side oh. for some reason. If it's that side when it's uploaded, I don't know. Um, mm. But yeah, I had a few questions. So um, my name is On, of course, Building Brawn with Faz Lift here. Thank you so much for your time and uh, joining me on this channel. Um, me and Faz have. Uh, so I've worked with Faz actually. He was my coach for a while, and I thought it'd be interesting to have him on the show here as well. Um, <clears throat> So first question I had for you was, what was your inspiration for lifting? So not exactly why you sort of went to the gym initially, mm. but what made you actually, like as a bigger a bigger aspect, what made you really step in there? Was it something or was it someone that really inspired you to do so? So I think I've told the story before about how I ended up lifting, which was um, I got injured playing football and I needed to do something. But in terms of my actual inspiration to start down a path of actually building muscle, yeah. It was probably um, these muscle magazines that my my brother, uh, my eldest brother, gave me uh, to read. And in those, there were actually some back in the day. They were pretty decent articles. So back in the day, you had the English version of Flex and English version of Muscle Mag, and um, they were some pretty good articles. So there were some articles by Dorian Yates and a couple of others by this guy called Stuart McRobert, who um, mm -hmm. wrote some very. They were both very similar. They both emphasised hard work on the basics, and even as a young kid, that sort of it struck a chord and I found it very inspirational that if I was trying to be a big strong guy then well I had to get strong and so Dorian yeah. was always banging on about getting strong on the basics and giving actually very sensible advice this was kind of before he got down the road that he's on now I think now um, all respect to Dorian I think he's great but I think mm -hmm. now he has very much a team of advertising people working with him and he he really emphasizes the differences in his training as opposed to the basics. But back then, he, all he wrote about was, and I imagine if you had spoken to him on the street, he would have just said, yeah, you just got to get bigger on the basics, make sure you eat lots of food. He gave really good advice for nutrition, um, moderate amount of protein he recommended, a lot of carbs, um, through rice, potatoes, that kind of thing, and some healthy fats, and just sticking to a routine of the big basic exercises. Pretty much what you and I would tell pretty much everyone really you know mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'd have some slightly different advice but um it was it was very sensible advice and even back then as an 18 year old a 17 year old inherently it just made sense to me like okay if this guy's big i probably need to get strong as well and this was before i'd even stepped foot into a regular gym and so that i guess was my inspiration because um back then if you had asked somebody um if they go to the gym or they work out they wouldn't really have thought you were talking about bodybuilding first of all because um oh, it's really it's really weird because now if you if you ask them hey do you, do you go to the gym they automatically assume you mean you know you, you body train, build, like, yeah. train all that stuff back then it was just an unknown factor I, I was one of my friends who trained at the gym one that's it um, and even at university none of my friends really trained um it was just it was they all played sports um no one really went to the gym for the sake of the gym the gym was very much an underground scene and as soon as I walked into the gym, it was all these just big cast outs of society, you know, um, certainly where I grew up anyway. Um, and it wasn't a mainstream endeavor like it is now. So yeah. those magazines were really inside a window into that world, which I would not have seen otherwise. I wouldn't have been. So if you're asking me who inspired me, it was, it was those magazines and the message in there. And like that opened me up because I would never have gone to one of those gyms. I didn't even know they existed in the city that I lived in. But there were about two or three small, independent, hardcore meathead gyms in which hardcore meathead guys lived. And I would have no access to them otherwise. Uh, but it was not a thing that people were doing, really, in 1999. Um, people played sports, and and that was about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just a couple of questions from that. So you mentioned how small it was, especially, especially where you were and everything, and how bodybuilding was so small. Did you find how, – how did you get access to those magazines in the sense of – how would you even catch your eyes? You know what I mean? It was such a small thing back then as well. And the other mm -hmm. one, if, you, if I can just couple it up with that, was um, you also mentioned how you were one of the only friends that did train. What did yeah. they think of you at the time? Was it more of like, a, oh my God, idiot? Or what, what was it like? So the, uh, the magazines, uh, for some reason, my eldest brother, was obsessed with muscle. I have no idea why. Okay. And um, when he's, he's, I think, about six years older than I am, or five years, something like that anyway. So he was... A little bit older he had done some training when he was when he was 18 and the magazines were now just collecting dust um that's all you know he, he didn't really have um 
uh, much of an interest in training when he was younger. But instead, he just gave me all the he gave me all the um, magazines and said, "Hey, have a read of this because you're recovering. You you hurt you hurt your ankle." And so um, that was it. I, I would not have picked up those magazines had it not been for him. I had a loose interest in, I guess, the cartoons. You know, like nowadays, um, a lot of the um, lifters like uh, Paris will uh, show the anime and stuff like anime, that. Yeah, 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 you yeah. Know, back, back then, it was um, Thundercats, Lion-O, who were these hyper-masculine figures of, you know, real big muscle. So I guess that's where the interest came. But I would not have thought of picking up those magazines. So it was really my elder brother who kind of piqued my interest and, and showed me a window into that world, which then led me on to talking, led me on to thinking about Dorian and then um, the book Brawn, which uh, eventually got me started. But uh, mm -hmm. in terms of what my friends thought, I, I think everyone was quite supportive of it. I think everyone thought it was... It was, I'll tell you what was interesting. It was very unique. You know, when you're 18, you don't really have a great deal going for you, right? You're just a blank slate. You don't really yeah. have a personality. You don't really have a thing. So what lifting gave me, because I took to it so well, I, I actually got quite big within the first year. Uh, it gave me a personality <laughs> in a weird way. Um, yeah. It gave everybody a talking point because I was very visibly large, you know? Right. Um, so I remember I, I worked for a company um, called Egg, which was a, back in the day, it was a really weird thing. Um, banks, this is a slight offshoot, but <laughs> banks, banks, there was a bank called Prudential, right? And Prudential decided that it wanted to have an online arm of Prudential. So instead of just saying, we're now Prudential online, it created a whole different company and called it Egg, which eventually went bust. But I, it was just a horrible idea. Like, why would you do that? Because it was so new, you see? So everyone thought, like, you can imagine Barclays coming up with a, a completely different Company yeah, yeah, yeah. Saying, this is now our online branch so now obviously it's all together but back then it was so new they didn't want it together but anyway i worked for this company for a year before i went to university and i competed in my first strongman competition the day before i was due to work at the at egg on my first day so oh. on the sunday i competed on the monday i arrived there and you know when you start with a new company they do all these uh, icebreakers so yeah. one of the questions was tell the group something that you that they, that they, they don't know about you or they won't they wouldn't guess about you and you had to yeah. put your answers in a bar in a bag and so my answer was i competed in a strongman competition yesterday and as soon as you read it out everybody stared at me and go yep it's definitely him it's like, <laughs> this guy yes yeah, so, but, but that was it was cool because it gave me it literally gave me a personality essentially at 18 okay. when you don't really have much to talk about you know yeah. so um yeah it gave me a sense of identity very very early on and i i held on to that for a large majority of my 20s and people identified me with with me being big yeah okay <clears throat> perfect so <clears throat> that kind of kind of ties in to what you're saying so in early days um, in your powerlifting days so what was your uh, mindset like i think i had this discussion slightly with Karel in terms of did you find yourself having like tunnel vision for a while in order to get those initial results or was it a case of you being able to always um, ban it slide um, and everything that came in the way sort of thing balance it and then still achieve the great results now what, what do you think yeah um, i mean um, it, initially i see nowadays i don't understand people's young people's perspectives when they say i'm going to compete when i'm ready i don't yeah. understand that at all because i i competed within nine months i didn't care about how good i was going to be i i literally didn't care i wanted to compete because it was something i wanted to do um i just felt like I want to get involved with something and I will get better. So let's just see where I'm at. I, there was there was never a case of, I'm going to wait till I'm ready. And I hear that all the time now. Um, it's like a, a fear of failure almost. Mm -hmm. they're, they're convincing themselves that when they approach the platform, they are going to dominate. And it never happens. They never compete and they never dominate because they never actually start on the path of competing. So they never really get robustly better. Whereas I competed after nine months of training. And as a result, I got my butt kicked and I realized uh, how much I have to to focus so the next time so my my goals were laser focused from that first year because I hit something like a 80 kilo bench um 120 kilo squat and a 180 deadlift like just mediocre numbers right yeah. but it meant that I had a focus so next year yeah. I had to beat those numbers and I had a burning desire to beat those numbers. That was all I was interested in. And I think the problem nowadays is when people have this really split focus, they don't want to compete and they don't really want to, they don't really want to put themselves at the bottom rung of an endeavor, whether it's bodybuilding or powerlifting. Yeah. Um, and so they think they get, they're either going to wait till they're ready or, um, and I know this is somewhat of the feature of the channel, but 
they will start to say things like i'm a power builder like yeah. and it, it makes no you know my thoughts on that it makes no yeah, sense yeah. you know it makes absolutely zero sense it's it's a nothing thing and yeah. so what it, what what it is it's a safety net to allow them to feel safe to say i'm not going to compete i'm not going to get better because i am this special snowflake thing and that's okay and I had no interest in that. I wanted to get better. And not only did I want to get better, I wanted to compete in the best federation. So I went straight to the to what was back then known as BAWLA, B-A-W-L-A, British Amateur Weightlifting Association, which is wow. now the GBPF, because after they split from weightlifting. Um, and then when I realized that lifting there um, wasn't going to work because they, did, they didn't have raw lifting, um, I went to the BDFPA, which is the British <laughs> Drug-Free Powerlifting Association, and I competed there for 10 years. Um, because they had a competitive raw division. And so not only did I want to compete, but I wanted to compete against the best because there is no other way to get better. So from, from my perspective, for, for everyone out there now who's thinking to themselves, yeah, this is a hobby, I want to do okay, great. You don't have to put in any extra time. Like I didn't put in extra time, but I was more focused. Uh, so I, I still put in four days a week at the gym. I was not doing anything extra. I still I still did the best with my meals. I wasn't the best at diet back then, mm. but I had much more of a concrete focus and I wasn't hiding behind this distant promise of I'll compete when I'm ready or whatever, whatever, whatever other else excuse that I might have. Um, yeah. And that was one of the reasons why my progress accelerated so fast. Yeah, I put myself in those, I put myself in hard situations and I became stronger for it. That's yeah. life, you know? Oh, yeah, so that's exactly why I asked this question to Karad as well, and I wanted your take on it because um, I was thinking like you can't balance your way or, or have a nice little walk towards like great things. I think you do have to have a, a point where you're like laser focused on something. So nice to take your take on it. Okay, go yeah, ahead. I mean, I'll, I'll push back on that a little bit. Um, I, I had a lo I had a lot of fun in my twenties. So as I say, there was there was nothing I did particularly different to if I hadn't competed. But I was just more laser focused. So, like you, you train, you train four days a week, I imagine, you know, yeah. something like that. I was yeah. the same. You know, I was the same. Um, the only thing is, when I was in the gym, I was a lot more focused on getting the result, um, and yeah. that, that's what I mean. Like, you don't need much more. You just need to have that focus and yeah. and not make excuses. Um, yeah, there was one more thing that I was going to say as well, but but anyway, well, I'll leave it there for now. But that I think yeah. I think I think it's important to to set yourself some concrete goals set yeah. in reality. You know, and 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 for me, like power building just isn't reality. It's not a it's not a thing. Um, so yeah. either compete in bodybuilding, either compete in powerlifting. Set yourself some goals and go after them and and execute. You know, it will give you a laser focus. Yeah, perfect. Uh, this is a bit of a fun one. So we got a question about how it was like training in the UK in the nineties. So oh, you yeah. started training with it in ninety nine. Uh, was it a bit early? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ninety nine. So and specifically about um, you mentioned in a few of your videos how there's a cloud around where you live of Dorian. Mm -hmm. Um, exactly. So, was there a lot of Dorian star training, or for you as well, or what you saw around? Um, and what was the influence in general, like just like about bodybuilding in the nineties? What was it like? Yeah, I've, I've got into so many conversations with people about Dorian and Dorian's training style. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it it got to the point where, like, people love to hear about it on the internet. I, I remember one of my first videos about Dorian. Um, Alex Leonidas came on in the comments, and he said he loved hearing about me retailing those stories. I yeah. I, I I like telling them because people like to listen to them but at the time i remember it being so annoying um like everybody was just obsessed with dorian and i couldn't do what i wanted to do without somebody coming up to me and going you shouldn't be training like that you should train like this because everybody yeah. was an expert because dorian said it would just annoy the hell out of me now i took most of my influence ironically from forums in america american forums you know oh, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so it was really weird i was this i was just this dumb 18 year old kid from england um, who had internet access very early on because um, our family had internet access quite early on because of my father's work. Um, and I was exposed to the internet, the wide internet. And I was, I was relatively tech savvy. Um, mm. And I was exposed to the internet and I spent a lot of time on American bodybuilding and mostly strength forums, but not bodybuilding.com, but actual strength, more underground strength forums. I spent a lot of time there. And I had all these influences from these really strong guys who were lifting a lot of weight and that was my goal because i was more i considered myself more a strength athlete so it there was always a bit of friction between yeah. me and the philosophies of other people in the in the gym 
um, because they were all doing the whole Dorian approach. I didn't want anything to do with that. Um, and I was training in my own way. And so I, there was still quite a lot of the older guys who didn't train like Dorian, um, guys who I still meet nowadays, who are now uh, 70 and 75 years old, um, who were powerlifters. There were a lot of powerlifters at the gym that I first went to, um, some really strong guys. And so I talked to them quite a lot and they all gave me some good advice. And uh, But yeah, there was definitely a large hardcore contingent, which was very, very pro Dorian. And I didn't typically get along with them because they also coincided with being the bodybuilder types who I also didn't relate to because I was a powerlifter. And uh, also, sadly, they were all mostly enhanced, which was not something I was interested in. And, and to be honest, if I'm being completely honest, um, Aeon, at the age of 18 to 20, I found them a bit intimidating because they were large, scary people yeah. on the outskirts of society. And I was a kid. Um, so I, I found them to be a little bit intimidating. So it, it wasn't really an easy conversation to be around these guys. Um, right. They were just big steadheads, basically. And you know, as a kid, you know, it's like, oh, I don't really know what to do with you because, you know, uh, you're not really part of my world. And so okay. early on, I, well, I guess one of the reasons why I find the whole, the cloud of Dorian so annoying is that early on, I thought it was very, it was very overwhelming. It was very stuffy. And I didn't really have a voice because I was just a kid. Now yeah. I do speak about it a lot more openly because I've had many conversations as an adult and I've refuted many people who've had this philosophy of training and I'm a lot more confident in my beliefs now. So, but in early on, I didn't really mix with those people very much at all. I, w I understood what was going on. I, I even trained with a few of them, the ones who were more willing to teach me. There was a couple of guys right. who actually taught me how to train like Dorian, guys who had trained with Dorian. I was very grateful for their advice and I was quite happy to take their advice. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't like was this oh you shouldn't be doing that you should be doing it this way there was you know people like you know now is that guy on, on instagram joey swall he's joey like Sol, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was <laughs> joey Sol would have had a field day back when i was um <laughs> coming up because there was so many people who were out to heckle you i remember my yeah. first competition my first powerlifting competition i i wanted to do squat raw like without any knee wraps that was not a thing in england right uh -huh. that, was, that was the thing right so i went as an 18 year old kid I squatted with a belt, no knee sleeves. Imagine how nervous I must have been at 18. Oh room God, full yeah. of people. I had to drive down to London to compete in this competition. So I didn't know anyone there, just me and my brother. And as soon as I walked up to the platform, you had these two old guys on the front uh, row whispering to themselves, there's another one without oh. any knee wraps. He's going to get his knees done in. Like, heckling me <laughs> as a kid. And you're so, about to approach the bar, so what you want to hear, isn't it? I just want, like, Joey Swall to swoop in from the ceiling like Batman, you know. <laughs> so, hey, you. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, but, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just part and parcel of growing up, isn't it, you know? But, yeah, um, yeah. So. but yeah, you know, um, it, I guess to, 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 to go back to you, answering your question, um, hmm. in, the, in the very early days, I tried to separate myself as much from that as possible by by immersing myself more into internet culture, which was really more American culture. Okay. So do you reckon you were not, I wouldn't say escape, but do you reckon you kept at a distance from that cloud, I suppose, oh, yeah. because of, Definitely. because you were trying to steer more towards, you, you found that more, uh, what was it? So you found that more proper, the American way of training or at the time? Um, yeah, so, I mean, it was, it was, no, yeah. go on, sorry. I was just going to say, because as a kid, if you go to a gym, you go with like a certain plan where you see yeah. all these big guys, these steadheads saying, oh, no, no, this is this. It would have been so easy. I mean, I think back when I started, I mean, I would have been like, and I did actually. A lot of these big guys told me, I was like, oh, okay. So I just used to bin whatever I knew from home. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's why I asked that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to get stick for keeping a training diary. Um, so I had used to have these little A5 notepads mm -hmm. because this was back when my you know, everyone had a mobile phone, like a Nokia 330, yeah. 3310. All you could do on that was um, make calls or play Snake. Snake, yeah. Really much so <laughs> I, had my, I had my pad. And I, I had, I mean, I've thrown them away now because, you know, phones are great, right? Technology yeah. is fantastic. Um, but I had just loads of these A5 notepads. And that's another thing that people would 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 ask me about, say, what's that about? Why, why are you writing all that stuff down? You should be training, man. Think about the intensity. Like, you're dude, right, just, leave right. alone, yeah. just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. I've got, I, I put five pounds of my squat today. I'm happy. Just leave me alone. So there, was, there was a lot of that, you know, there was a lot of that in the early yeah. days. Um, even right, even right up to 2010, I remember was, people were, you know, the whole logbooking thing is actually relatively new. Um, yeah. And nowadays, you get people who go even 
further into that and you get these hipsters who insist on using a notepad where nowadays we have like iPhones and stuff, which is yeah. just the most stupid thing ever. Listen, as soon as I as soon as I got a phone that I could log my workouts in, I threw the notebooks out of the way yeah, because yeah, yeah. they are they were not useful at all. So yeah. um yeah, but anyway, slight segue. Uh, people love being hipsters. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I, yeah, I did kind of like separate myself a little bit because just because my interests lied lay mostly in powerlifting. So even when I went to university um, in Liverpool, mm -hmm. there wasn't really a, a strong powerlifting scene there at all. It, but it was a very strong bodybuilding scene, and it was an even stronger enhanced bodybuilding scene. So again, I was even further separated from them. Um, I mean, the bouncers. Right. The bouncers loved me. They thought I was just this strong student who yeah. they didn't, you didn't really know much about because they were all these, you know, big steadheads who lifted a lot of weights and pumped their way through whatever they did, you know, mm -hmm. trained the way steadheads train. And I was this young kid who was a student who was actually quite strong. And so when I used to go to the nightclubs uh, back in the day, you know, yeah. uh, they're like, hey, it's, it's him, you know, <laughs> let him in. So that was quite nice. But then I was growing up and I was probably, you know, early 20s at that stage. Um, then I, then things, I became a lot more confident and you know that it was it was easier to mold the two but still all right up until 2014 i was still very much into my powerlifting and i was not and i would never have considered myself a bodybuilder at all i had no intention of ever being a bodybuilder whatsoever it just wasn't even an interest of me to the point where i would purposely not train you know biceps and stuff because i just didn't really see a point in it which was not the thing to do don't do that um but yeah i was all into powerlifting it was my complete world yeah it was just strength that's all you cared about was it it's all i cared about especially and, early days yeah. i think you have to really love strength in my experience like mm -hmm. some people like the idea of being strong but i think you have to really love strength it's one of the reasons one of the things i've got against the whole power building thing it's like people don't really love strength like it takes a special person to really love strength because you don't get much from strength strength doesn't doesn't you don't see strength in a person like through a t-shirt you know, yeah. if you're a bodybuilder, you see the cuts, you see the leanness, you see the yeah. size. You know, I look better now, like even though I was yeah. bigger before. Um, so you uh, you really have to love strength because the training is miserable. It's horrible. Um, you get maybe a five pound on your squat every few months. It's hard. You, everything hurts. Um, and you, you don't get as much visibly from it as a bodybuilder would. You don't get that satisfaction. You don't get the fun feeling of getting a pump yeah. in feels great um you don't get all that you know you just get here's your training for today it's gonna suck right so do it and you will get a modicum of, of appreciation inner appreciation for that you'll like it um so you have to really love strength and I, I think the problem i have with people who who pretend they like strength is that they just like the idea of wanting to be strong and a lot of people don't train for strength correctly either they just do one rep maxes and two rep maxes with spotter assistant and call it strength yeah. training which is not as i explained in a recent video you have yeah. to build up volume with fives and eights and stuff like that and that is how you build strength and so if it, it takes a special person to really love strength for strength's sake and this is why when i'm coaching people i do ask them you know what is more important to you do you want to be do you want to be big or do you want to be strong and if it is you just want to look big cool let's just go with that like you don't really want to be strong, and so you're not going to be able to put up with the discomfort that it takes yeah. to be strong. Because um, when I talk about being strong and getting strong, I'm talking about competing as a powerlifter. I'm thinking, or a strongman. You know, yeah. for me, training to for strength is serious business. It is just purely training for strength. So when people have this mixed view of, oh, oh I kind of want a bit of both. No, they don't. They're bullshitting. What they really want is they want to be a bodybuilder. And they're going to get stronger in it because, but they're not going to get the type of strong that I was because I trained for strength. That's another reason why power building is just BS. It's not a thing. You're a bodybuilder. That's what you are. Just call yourself a bodybuilder. That's all it is, you know. And that's what. And there's nothing wrong with that. Be a bodybuilder. I'm a bodybuilder, you know. But this is my my issue with that is, people have this, have this. Um, they they want to appear like they're getting everything. You're not. You're a bodybuilder. That's all. And and that's fine. So that that's kind of my issue with that, but yeah. So I think it takes someone to who really loves strength. But anyway. So wh why do you think that is? If you like to share, like, why do you think people BS BS it? Why do they not just? Is it the the fact that they want to be in that elite strength level, but don't they can't put up with it, or is it just because they don't know what to do exactly to say? They just want to do both and the ego lift, or 
if you, you want well, to put a finger on it. I think there's a lot of reasons why people gravitate towards power building. Um, mm. I think a lot of it is, if we look at it initially, it's down to a misinterpretation of what bodybuilding is, first of all. I think a lot of people's interpretation of bodybuilding is you just lift light weights and pump your muscles up like you're pumping up a, a, a bike tire <laughs> full of air, right? But it's not. You know, Bodybuilders mm. are ridiculously strong. And they're yeah. strong in rep ranges, which are different to powerlifting, uh, similar, similar, but different. Um, and they're strong in a broad range of exercises. Bodybuilders are the very definition of what power builders say they want to be. So when somebody says to me, I want, I'm a power builder, I value muscle and strength, all they're telling me is they don't understand what bodybuilding is. Bodybuilding That's is. all. Yeah. You know? So yeah. typically power builders and the most famous ones have never competed in bodybuilding, have never gotten lean, have never really accomplished anything in that field at all. And that mm -hmm. is then what they then that is then what they promote to their audience because they have this fundamental misunderstanding. So, but the, there's a consequence of that, Aeon. The consequence is you hold yourself back. The, the problem, the other problem I have with power building, especially coming for as a coach and as a former school teacher is you hold yourself back. There is no standard for power builders, okay? Mm. You don't have to be lean, okay? You, don't, you never have to be lean because, oh, I'm, I'm a power builder, don't have to be lean. Screw it. Yeah. I, can, I, can, I can have a bad diet. I can be fat. It doesn't matter. And I won't even struggle for it because getting lean is a struggle. Like for me, it was a six month grueling prep to compete in my first bodybuilding show. It was horrible. Mm. Um, so it's a struggle. And they, they take themselves away from that struggle because they're a power builder. Also, form doesn't have to be on top of the thing. The form doesn't have to be good either. Form for the squat, form for the bench. They never really have yeah. to learn correct form for squat, bench, rows, overhead pressing, anything, because you know what, anything goes. I'm a power builder, who cares? We have no definition. You oh, ask no. one person what a power builder is, ask another person, it's all different things. So you hold yourself back in terms of exercise form. And then there's no standards, you know? Well, okay, have you ever competed in powerlifting? Well, no, so how do you know how good you are? Wait, yes. hey, I'm a power builder, it doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> there's no competition. It's, it's, uh, the, the bottom line is, it's a made up term. You know, and if I was to analogize it to something, I would say, you know, there are many people out there who don't fit, who don't feel that it can fit into the binary categories of either power building or bodybuilding. And they want to have this new classification and they want everyone to refer to them as this new classification because they're a special snowflake. The reality is they're just scared of not committing to either powerlifting or bodybuilding. And ultimately that fear is holding them back. They wear it like a moniker of pride, but it's holding them back. You're never going to be lean. You're never going to be strong because you're just this airy fairy, non-committed lifter who doesn't do, who doesn't really get strong and doesn't really get lean or big. So you hold yourself back, and that's my issue because, as a coach and as a former school teacher, the worst thing you can do is hold back your potential. I would not want to spend, have spent 20 years of my life, trying to tell everybody and convince everybody and myself that I'm a power builder. I'm happy that I competed in powerlifting, strongman, and bodybuilding. I accomplished things. Yeah, sure, I got a plastic trophy. Who cares? It means nothing. But I did something, and it pushed me onto heights, which I would not have gotten to if I hadn't competed. And I just had this made-up term because anything goes. I wouldn't have gotten lean. I wouldn't have gotten strong. And so I don't like the term because it holds people back. And, and no one has yet presented me with a good argument to say that, anything to the other to the contrary um and i, and I don't like it when influencers and not yourself i, I don't like it when large influencers yeah. promote it because it is holding their audience back it's um yeah. it's yeah but that's it and yeah. i think um yeah the way you mentioned it there it can be quite damaging for people that are new and looking into the space the fitness space as well mm. um, i think so with that would come a lot of misinformation as well so i'll probably take my video down <laughs> <laughs> I, you are well, listen. I think with with your with your videos, I really like the fact you're doing them. And I made loads of mistakes. You know, you, you got to remember when I when I got onto YouTube, I was I had already been coaching for a number of years, and so. Yeah. But even then, I made loads of mistakes. I'm just glad you're doing stuff. I think it's good. Yeah, I no. think you have a good voice, so you should. Do oh, it. thank you. I think with with that video, I think at one point what I was I was trying to say was that this term power building is genuinely just bodybuilding, and we were yes. just bodybuilding anyway because of progressive over, um, overload and stuff. But yeah. I couldn't quite make it as clear as you've done, obviously. With, 
20 plus years of experience there so i would i would love if you if you committed fully to bodybuilding because then at some point yeah. uh, then at some point a fire would light and you would think at some point in the next three years i'm going to compete and that would be amazing that's the discussion we had um i think it's back in 22 was it or 21 when when, yeah, you were, yeah. when i was working right, yourself right. yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm still i'm still looking looking towards yeah, that yeah. obviously but i think i think if you if you if you go with the down the power building route you won't ever yeah. have you won't ever fan those flames because you don't have to there's no urgency yeah, exactly. you know? whereas if you say to yourself hey you know what? i'm a bodybuilder okay well the natural conclusion is at some point you're probably going to want to either step on stage or do a photo shoot great yeah. cool. and so you push yourself you or you push yourself that a little bit further than you would do normally perfect now of course um so i was looking at another question we had i think I was going to link this with a previous question, but we've gone in a different tangent, so I'll, I'll put it back. So, uh, put off on a tangent about power yeah, building. <laughs> it's part of the I guess. I mean, so this question I had was basically related to, this sounds sound so dumb now like, because it's not related to anything we've said in the last 10 minutes, but <laughs> okay. it was about the, um, without the technology and resources, that's what my question was, but I think you've sort of answered that now, saying you had access um, to the internet quite early, but I was just saying yeah. how you um, found the right information or the best information for yourself in that time where there wasn't a lot of information and yeah. secondly there's not a lot of um places you can get information from so i know you mentioned mm. there's small forums here and there um how did you find your way out i suppose that would probably be the best way to put it it's a really good question um so after i hit my initial plateau i went back to my community of online lifters and i asked them what should i do and they all told me they were all low volume advocates and they all told me look you've reached your genetic limit you're 19 years old you've hit your limit 200 pound pinch and uh, that's it you just should be happy with it now and you just live the rest of your life you know with the 200 pound bench or 300 pound squat and that's it you've hit your limit um i then looked elsewhere so i started to look for other lifters and i was buying books actual physical books from america so i bought doug hepburn's biography i mm -hmm. bought iron mind I bought a bunch of lifting books. I bought um, Keys to Progress by John McCallum. Um, I've, I've still got them all. I've got it's a collection of 30 books and I would try and devour information from anywhere. I would speak to people online, people who knew more than I did, who were getting jacked. I still was very wary of actual bodybuilding forums because I wasn't a bodybuilder. So I didn't spend any time on bodybuilding.com at all. That was just a weird foreign place that I didn't like. Um, I wanted to speak to powerlifters and Typically, what was happening was power lifters were doing more volume. And so the next natural progression for me was to go to a four-way split. And I used this training split for, I would say, between 2003 to 2007. Um, it was a four-way training split, and it was based off what was fairly popular during the course, of the, during the day um, I uh, on the forums. It was, a, it, was, it was a very typical American like powerlifting type of setup. Um, what I guess nowadays, I don't know if people would agree with this, but back in the day, it was what was classified as American powerlifting method. So you have the Russian right. powerlifting method, which is very frequent, the Chinese, which is frequent with variations, and then you have the American, which is basically you have a squat day, a bench day, a deadlift day, and like a squat assistance or overhead press day, yeah. kind of like what Ed Cohen would do, basically, mm -hmm. right? So that was what we called the American powerlifting method back in the day. But um, so I essentially did that for between 2003, 2007, experimenting with different rep ranges, but ultimately just doing a lot of volume. And right. particularly to move my bench press up, my bench press, to move my bench press from 200 pounds to 300 pounds and, and 330 pounds, I think I did at weighing 180 pounds. Um, that was my best. I had to do a routine which was based off of this routine, which was going around at the time. And you did five singles followed by five by five. Oh, wow. On your main lift on the day. So the uh, Monday, I did five singles, followed by five by five. Can you imagine, like, talking to me on a Monday and saying, hey, I've got 10 sets of bench to do. <laughs> I'll be done in a half an hour. So <laughs> but there was that, and I did that with another five sets of, I think it was incline press, mm -hmm. followed by five sets of chins, five sets of rows, and then five sets of my Kelso shrugs and yeah. some arm work. So it was a big routine, and I would do all that on a Monday. Tuesday would be squat day. Um, and typically I favored a much lower volume approach. So one of the things that I was starting to do as I got to the intermediate stage, which I think could be a nice lesson for your viewers is mm -hmm. I was starting to separate my training for the different lifts. Bench lift, bench training was very voluminous. There was a lot of volume there. That was just the first day I described and it was a ton of volume. Um, the squat days were much less volume, but much higher in intensity. 
And the um, overhead press and bench assistance days were also quite high volume. Deadlift days were quite low volume, and that was my weekly cycle. And I followed that routine between 2003 to roughly 2007, where I where I tore my hamstring coming back from uh, Asia. Um, but um, that was a very good setup, and it was something that I would still recommend to people having a basic upper lower split. I think I would probably organize things differently now. I wouldn't do as many singles because I don't think they're as necessary. Mm -hmm. And I would just be a bit more tactif tactical about how I increase volume. Back then, right. as I was explaining in a recent video, we didn't really count volume with sets. We just kind of tried a routine, <laughs> and one routine was harder, the other routine was easier. We didn't really know how to count volume with sets. Right. It wasn't a thing. Sounds really obvious now. You count sets for a muscle group, but that wasn't really something we did. So I just tried things. I tried this five singles, five by five routine. It worked, so I kept doing it. And I tried another routine for the squat. It worked. I kept doing it. For the squat, I realized it was more about assistance exercises. So I used a good morning and the leg press as my main assistance, and that helped build my squat up. At the time, I had this formula that if I could, whatever I could leg press for a set of five for double the weight of the squat, is what I could squat. So if I wanted to squat, uh -huh. it sounds weird, but it worked. If I wanted to squat uh -huh. 200 kilos, yeah. I needed to be able to leg press 400 for five. And it worked. Uh -huh. It worked. Okay. I, you know, whatever. It worked. Um, and so there was that. And then there was my deadlift uh, formula. I use a lot of deficit deadlifts. I use a lot of rack pulls, stuff like that. But I, what I, my, my point with this is I started to separate training for different lifts. I was starting to individualize. I knew what I needed for the bench. I knew what I needed for the squat. And it, it started to look different. Whereas previously, it was all very much uniform. Everything was low volume. And that was when I also started to experiment with deloads. And um, right. so those two things combined got my lifts to be quite respectable. Um, mm -hmm. At 83 kilos, I was squatting 227, um, benching 150, and deadlifting 235 at 82, which is decent, you know. Not too bad. Very, very good numbers. So 83 kilograms, did you say you were? Yeah, maybe just say that was when I was still growing. I was still sort of small. Yeah. Then. I was still probably late 20s. I think I was still mm -hmm. quite small. It was only as I reached my early 30s is when I made a big effort to really gain weight. And that's when my yeah. numbers, mostly for my bench, really started to shoot up. Very good. Okay, so we've got a question here about, this is going quite back now. So you mentioned a few times that you were, as a kid, you were a fat kid. Um, so that must have been quite difficult, of course, to deal with uh, emotionally, physically. Um, but could you elaborate on how you broke out of those eating habits? Like, um, I know you mentioned obviously you had these forums again, uh, the access yeah. to the internet, but obviously when we were working together, it was quite difficult for me to instill these habits in there as well. How was that like for yourself? You did um, great. You did what, great. Was it, what was the system that you fell into? Was it straight away where you had a habit-based eating system like you do now, or was it like a calorie counting? Or what? Go? No, no. I mean, firstly, I'll say you you did at the age you're at now. You did a lot better than I did at my at the same age, um, and you also were sensible enough to hire a coach. Um, I wasn't. <laughs> so my I was not interested in diet at all. Just like I wasn't interested in bodybuilding, I wasn't interested in improving my diet whatsoever, uh, okay. which is not good. I. It's, it sounds contradictory, but what I, in my mind, as long as I could stay loosely within the category, I was okay. Um, but when I was 93 kilos, I could have been 83. When I was 83 kilos, yeah. I could have been 75. So I didn't do that right, but I was loosely in the category. So I thought, eh, whatever, it's fine. And I had zero interest in learning about diet. So my 93 was not a good looking 93. I mean, you guys have probably seen the, the pictures. There's a video, there's a picture on my website of my transformation from sort of 100 kilo to down to 80 kilos and what that looked like. So I was big, yeah. but I was very fat. So no, I had absolutely zero interest in, in diet for a long time. Probably I would I would do crash diets and then oh, smash cool. the weight back on. I, I struggled with my weight for a long period of time across my 20s. But weirdly enough, you, you mentioned um, how did I cope with that? I had this odd sense of um, confidence which I think arose from uh, people around me. You know, I had very good yeah. friends. I had my brothers who were also very good. Um, and I had, because of the support network that I had, I never felt self-conscious, um, you yeah. know, and, so, and, and, and I was reasonably popular, you know, because of my size. Um, so, and I, and, I, and I was at some point, I assure you, I was reasonably good looking uh, back in the day. <laughs> So <laughs> it's all gone to crap now, but, but um, so I was, um, you know, it was, it was a case of, I never felt 
bad about it yeah. necessarily. Um, and I also, you have to remember, there was less social media around, so there was less people to yeah. compare myself to. I had my friends to compare myself to who were all, mostly all, skinny fat and, you know, in far average, shape yeah. was the average guy. So, <laughs> yeah, I had, a, I had an odd sense of undeserved confidence. Um, it was only really probably, I would say, probably when I, when I retired from powerlifting that I really started to focus on diet and I started to learn more about it. And I was exposed to a lot of misinformation initially. A lot of information which wasn't really appropriate for me, but eventually I muddled through and I I stumbled across various things. I mean, I you and I worked together and I, I taught you about the habit based routine, yes. but there's also meal plans, there's also uh, macros and calories. I have multiple yes. ways that I work with my clients and I've tried them all. So, but it, the point is, I had a system. Yeah, much later in life, it took me a long time to get there. Perfect, and I think a lot of people can probably relate with that. So that story is awesome to share. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> now. Let's see here. Okay, so this was more based on, I'd say, more recently. You have said you've had to lose size in order to be in a fitter shape, in a, in a better shape in terms of yeah. more gearing towards your health. Yeah. So, um, uh, so yeah, if you can discuss the psychological effects this had on you, because of course everyone around, even your support system, would have been like, "Oh, Faz, you're a small man. What's going on?" Like, you know, no, you have yeah. that sort of chat as well. And then, yeah. how did you adapt to that mentally, physically? Obviously, still. Thinking about it, was there times where you're like, you know what, screw it, I'm just going to still just keep getting big, this is whatever. But if you could take us through that journey from the decision you made till when you pulled through. Yeah, it was it was tough actually. Um, so I competed in 2018, hmm. and at the time I was age 38. Um, now, I had decided that I would start to downsize when I was in my 40s because I thought it's just, it's not worth it really um, to be that big because I, I would walk around 100 kilos. And to put that into perspective, my elder brother walks around about 65 and we have similar height, similar structure. So <laughs> it's a lot bigger. I mean, for those of people who see my channel and see, I sometimes I share training footage. I'm not small now. You know, I walk around at about a, a reasonable condition, 85 kilos. But back then I was a similar condition, maybe slightly out of shape, um, 95 to 100 kilos. So I was a lot bigger. Yeah. Now I, re I realized that due to sort of BMI and stuff, that was not going to be healthy going to my 40s. And I was very aware of having reached my peak. And this is something which I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about. Yeah. Um, there are still people in the city that I live in who ask me if I'm going to compete again ever. And, you know, when I when I tell them, it's probably not. They sort of express me, come on, Faz, you've still got it. And I, and I think to myself, um, I've been training and competing now for over 20 years. Now, mm -hmm. if I hadn't reached my peak by now, then I would have been very disappointed with myself. You know, like the fact is I, I reached my strength peak and my size peak probably in my mid thirties. And that was because I started so early. So I'd been training at that point for almost 20 years. Now, if I hadn't peaked and started to decline, I would be sat here really wondering what the hell did I do all those years mm. because inevitably at some point you peak everybody does and they start to decline and that's when you have to realize okay i'm not going to be that size anymore it's just not going to happen i have too many injuries uh, the body just gets exposed through a lot of things it's not even the injuries per se the body just gets put through a lot and it's just not on the cards anymore so i still hold a good amount of size but mm. but there is no way and i think if you are the kind of guy who's in his 40s and is insisting that they're going to do just one more run one last bulk and they're going to get really big this time you're fooling yourself i i if you do make some size gains in your 40s odds are you were just sandbagging your entire life there's, there's no other you know there's no other way around it like what, what were you yeah. doing in your 30s how are you all of a sudden making gains in your 40s when you weren't in your 30s that makes no sense you know in your 30s yeah. you had a great hormonal profile you had a fresh body and you should have peaked mm. if somebody starts to gain a lot of size in their 40s, um, they, they did something wrong in their 30s. So the fact that I'm downsizing now, to, to answer your question, yeah. I'm, I'm at peace with that now. <laughs> Wasn't always, but I'm at peace with that now because I realize that I put it all out on the platform. I have a cupboard full of trophies, which lets me know when I'm old and senile what I did. I'm getting there, not, not too far off, what I did. you know. So if I had not done that, and I would be a lot more. Um, I would have been. I would be a lot more keen to give it one last run, one last yeah. bulk, one last heavy training cycle, 
I'd be a lot more keen to do that. But I'm, I don't need to do that because I already understand I've peaked. And every every lifter is going to come to that realization at some point, mm. whether they like it or not. But what I would rather people do, and again to go back to our original conversation, was bloody do it, you know, <laughs> while you're young. Yeah. Gra grab life by the balls and and do it. Um, don't be shy about it. Do it. Mm -hmm. Um, because at some point you're not going to be able to, and you're going to wish you had, there's nothing worse than regret. And if you yeah. have gone through your entire life and you've been in the gym four days a week and you haven't become the person who you wanted to become in that endeavor, it's the saddest thing. Um, yeah. cause I I'll tell you what, Aeon, mm -hmm. I, what I don't want to do is I don't want to blink because the last time I blinked. I was your age and now I'm my age. And if I blink again, I'll be 65. Like it happens so fast and people sit around and they dick around with their, yeah. I'm going to compete when I'm ready. I don't need to get stronger. I'm a power builder or whatever. I don't need to get lean over this and this and that. They dick around with all that stuff yeah. and before they know it, they're past it. Yeah. You don't want to do that. I'm happy that I did what I did. I left it all out there and I'm, I'm left with a good competitive career, a reasonably good competitive career, a good coaching career, a good personal life. And I'm happy with where I am in life. Like there shouldn't be this sense of regret. And the reason I talk about it so much is because as a school teacher and as a coach, especially as a school teacher, not so much as a coach, as a school teacher, I used to see this a lot. Students who just wouldn't put in the work because they didn't care. And there is nothing that I could have said to them to express to them, the disappointment that they would have received themselves. There is nothing that I can say to them. There's no punishment that I can give, which is going to be more punishment but it's than the punishing feeling of regret that they will yeah. get when education is over and they are left without. And in this case, when your body is past it and you think, why didn't I just go and do that competition? I would have still trained four days a week. I would have still ate the same food, but I just would have tried a little bit harder. And it would have been a bit more fun and it would have been a bit more of an adventure. But instead, I thought, I'm going to wait till I'm ready. And I kept waiting till I was ready. And next thing I know, I'm 40 and mm. I'm past it now. One of the things I love about guys like um, Paris Butler and um, Alex Leonidas is they are in the arena. Like I understand where they are now. And it's so exciting yeah. like, to live life like that. I can't tell you how exciting it is to wake up every day with that kind of purpose. Like, yeah. I. I just think I, I know what they're going through on a daily basis and I love it. And that's what I want everyone to experience because we only live once. And again, yeah. just don't you blink and that's it. You're going to be on this position and some other young guy will be interviewing you next time you blink. <laughs> so um, get it done. Yeah. But anyway, I forget what your original question was. I think I've rambled. No, no, no you've answered that really beautifully. Yeah. I just want to say, yeah, that's, that's uh, really happy with that answer. I just want to say <clears throat> how lucky we are to have you on YouTube to tell us all this, you know, because like, there's probably people in this position where they have probably just they're going to blink and then that's where they end up. So but that, was, that was a nice little uh, heartwarming answer there. <laughs> Perfect. So um, yeah, so this one is relating to coaching. Hmm. You know, what was it that made you want to start coaching? I asked Karel this question also as well, hmm. um, just so you can get into um, into the mindset of an actual coach. So. Hmm. And also, where was Fazlift if it wasn't on YouTube before when you did start coaching? Uh, mm. Just a bit, if you want to share about, as much as you want to share, actually, about the journey. Yeah. So I was, um, I was asked to coach. Um, so there yeah. was a guy, there was a guy, there was two guys in particular, one guy called yeah. Mark, <laughs> and Mark asked me to coach him. Um, the, where I live, the city I live, it's it's a relatively small city. People kind of know <laughs> who you are. And if you're competing in bodybuilding, you're competing in strength sport, people know who you are. And if you've competed for as long as I have. Um, so he knew I was retired at this point, 2014 had retired. And uh, he said, uh, do you fancy coaching me? And I was like, okay, cool. And so I coached him for free because okay. I thought, well, I'm just gonna, and I, I tried to do it formally because I, I realized in 2014, 15, people were coaching, like online coaching was a thing, okay? And so I said, okay, I wanna try and make this formalized. So I said, okay, I'm gonna coach you, I'm gonna coach you for free, but I'm gonna try and take it seriously. So I created a spreadsheet, did all that stuff and shared it with him and everything. And I took it really seriously. And so that first coaching job, he basically employed me. <laughs> he, and he said, look, you've got the expertise. And he, he's a great guy, we're still in touch. Um, and um, he's, 
you know, so he he said, look, I think you can do this. I'd like your help. I was like, okay, great, cool, willing to help. So um, that was the phys first physique client. The first powerlifting client was something very similar. It's a guy called Harry. And mm -hmm. again, Harry approached me in the gym. He realized my passion for lifting and he wanted to be where I was, you know, or where I had been. And so again, he asked me and that was my first coach. That, that was after Mark. And so I, I was charging money at that point. And it, I was really cheap, like hardly any money, you know, at that mm. point, just because I was just trying to make a name for myself. Not even uh, really make a name for myself. I didn't really know what I wanted out of coaching because at that stage, I was still very much into teaching. You know, I had a full plan for teaching that I was going to be, you know, right up there. Um, so my first coaching gigs were essentially people who came up to me and said, look, would you like to coach me? Now, as that caught wind and as people started to see results with me, more and more people asked to coach. And I said, OK, so I thought I need to systematize this. And that sort of coincided with me taking on more clients. Um, so before before Fast Lifts was on YouTube, um, I didn't have a particularly large following outside of England and outside of my little city that I live in. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, I did have a podcast which I started in 2018 and I had a lot of contacts in America, a lot of my sort of bodybuilding friends in America, Australia. So there was some, you know, advertising going on there, but I was still very small time. I'm still very, I'm still nobody now, but um, I was even smaller back then. I was completely unknown anywhere else. Uh, and most of my clients were coming through the doors from the city I live in or surrounding areas, certainly in England. Mm -hmm. There were a couple who came through from listening to the podcast, which surprised yeah. the hell out of me. But um, yeah, before YouTube was the podcast. And to be honest, Aon, the reason I did the podcast and not YouTube was because I didn't really think anyone would want to look at me. That was, that's, no. That was, yeah, no, really. I did. I thought, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm some, some old dude who's talking on, on a camera. Oh, no, really, um, no, so I started podcasts. So I thought I will just speak, you know, and it was um, reasonably popular, I guess. But the thing is, just like you're doing now with YouTube, I was exploring um, how to make good content and what, what works and what doesn't. Yeah. And uh, this is why I'm so encouraging of you to actually do YouTube because you don't need advice. You just need to do it, you know, and you will learn as you go along. Um, and that was the same with the podcast. So it's, it's, it's moderately popular right now. It's just acts as a, um, an audio version of my YouTube. That's all. But yeah. before it was actually podcast topics. I would sit down once or twice a week and I would just talk about things I wanted to talk about. And I, uh, I really enjoyed it, actually. It was quite um, therapeutic. But then I realized later on, um, that's actually not that great for views. <laughs> so yeah. podcast isn't self-therapy. Podcast is supposed to be helping people. And so um, nowadays, the work that I do on YouTube um, is much more aligned towards helping people. I, I approach yeah. YouTube much more like I would be a school teacher trying to teach people something. And um, one of the comments that I get quite a lot is people like the way that I explain things. So yeah. it's always an aim of mine to explain something that people will understand and yeah. to correct any misweaknesses. So yeah, um, Fastlift started off very humbly. Um, YouTube was very big for the business as a whole. Um, and I can see myself doing YouTube. You know, I, I don't think I'll be stopping YouTube anytime soon, for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I have, I will say one more thing uh, on this. I have no real intention of trying to be a celebrity on YouTube at all. I don't really have any intention of trying to be like no burning desire to have 100k subs for example um yeah. i i do it because i enjoy it but i have other ways of advertising my business i don't rely on trying to be a celebrity which i think a lot of youtubers do and i think i imagine it's quite a stressful experience especially if you're it's not going very well yeah <laughs> so, no, for sure. um yes yeah, so i i i would prefer to live a quiet life and advertise my business in other ways so perfect uh, thank you um and yeah so this one was a bit more about the so the client that will come up to you if you can give us habits or what an ideal client looks like when you when you when it comes to the door how would you know right this 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 person here uh, or the attributes actually per se if we, if we can mm. touch on that as well um yeah okay yeah and then yeah what's or if, if that if not what sort of habits would you say would be key habits to employ in themselves in order to mm. get up to a great start as a client so as well so I've heard from other coaches that the ideal client is very self-motivated, does all his check-ins correctly and does all this kind of stuff. And I call BS on that completely. Um, that to me is a sign of a lazy coach um, mm -hmm. because a coach, what that coach is describing is a inherently intrinsically motivated person, person who is self-motivated. Mm -hmm. Now, 
yes, that's a great client. Don't get me wrong. Fantastic. But what you're, if a, if a coach is saying, this is what you need to be, you need to be um, self-motivated. You need to be, have your workouts all done, eat your diet all done and, and not asking any questions. That's not a coach. That's just somebody who's taking your money. That's not coaching, mm -hmm. right? Let's just put that out there. That's a, an inefficient, ineffective coach. It's your job to get people to do all those things. That's your entire job. That would be like me saying the ideal student as a school teacher is somebody who turns up, does all the work, and understands everything first time. Dude, <laughs> that's your job, bro. Like, yeah, that's yeah, literally yeah, that's your true. job to break things down, to make people understand, and to get people to do things that they don't necessarily want to do, but is in their best interest to do. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I can always tell, um, I can always, I can very much tell who, who is, who, who has got their head screwed on right when it comes to coaching, who hasn't. Um, and there are, there are people out there in the space who I very much respect who would never say something like that. They would never say, here's my ideal client. They do all the workouts on time. They, they eat all their food. No, because they understand. A person, who, a coach who says that doesn't even understand what's wrong with that. A person yeah. who says that, I'll put it out there on the internet, like really proud of themselves. This is what you should all look to be like. They don't even know what they don't know. And I, I yeah. and yes, I've, I've been coaching for nine years, but like I've been teaching for a lot longer, so I can speak very confidently on this subject because teaching is a lot like coaching. Mm -hmm. There are two aspects. There's a duality of coaching. This is something to for your clients to understand because your, your viewers, sorry, to understand because quite a lot of your viewers will be clients to other coaches. And it's important mm -hmm. for them to understand this. There's a duality of coaching and teaching. One, you have to know the subject matter, okay? And two, you have to be able to actually coach. So there are two different things. In teaching, we call it subject knowledge versus pedagogy. Pedagogy is literally the act of teaching. How do you get people, or students in this case, to do the things that are gonna get them the results? How do you get them to turn up for after school classes? How do you get them to do the work? How do you get them to understand concepts? So if you have somebody who says, hey, I just wish all my students would just understand everything first time so I can go home and chill and watch Netflix, you're yeah. not a school teacher. Just like you're not a coach if you say, oh, here's my perfect client. So the coach's job is to get to shape that client and provide them with the empowerment so they can do all those things. Now, you ask what a perfect client is, well, I would say a client is just somebody who's willing to take that on board. That's it who's willing to work with you with an open heart, with an open mind, okay? Yeah. That's it, that's really all it is. Now, a client has already expressed interest in you because they're paying you money, right? Mm -hmm. So they've, they've already taken that first step. They will need some more cajoling as well. But that is a crucial thing to understand. Like, it is our job to get them to the point where they are able to do these things. And it'll probably be looking like, it'll probably look like an iterative process where we begin by setting them small goals, building some efficacy, explaining concepts, perhaps looking at form, having conversations with these people, you know, it's a, it's an iterative joint collaboration. It's not one man as a tyrant shouting at people saying, yeah. why aren't you the perfect client? That's not a coach. And yeah. people need to wake up and recognize that that's not coaching. Mm -hmm. Um, just like, you know, uh, with example, with a teacher, it's not teaching. Yeah. So I would say the ideal client is just simply somebody who is willing to engage in my yeah. method and my method can get them the results they want if they're willing to engage yeah perfect yeah because i do see that quite a lot on instagram saying well, my yeah. ideal profile of a client is this 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 and you read it it's sort of like what do you mean isn't it your job to make the client work uh, in an ideal ideal way so, of course yeah. it is of course it is yeah exactly. uh, yeah, but the the, the the fitness, bodybuilding fitness industry is a very unregulated industry. And yeah, so you know, sure. um, it's what it is. Yeah. Actually, on the flip side, how would you, um, would you be able to comment on how a client finds the right coach? And that's just a question I've come up right now. Good uh, idea. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so I, I would say, yeah, yeah, no, I, it's, it's a good question. So I would say, um, well, if, talking to ex-clients is variable because again, it kind of depends on some of the success stories. You can have a coach which has, who has, like I know a coach who at any one point in his roster, 30% of his clients are AWOL. Now, if that was me, I would think something is seriously wrong with my method yeah. if that's the case. But he's told me, look, at any one point, 30% of his clients are just off the boil. Mm. 
that's not good. There's no engagement there. So I would look, I would look at discussing with some of those clients, but that's not going to give you the whole picture. I would rather look at the way he posts online. Okay. What he puts out there. Is he willing to engage in discussion? Now, go ahead and look at my comments on any of my YouTube videos. Okay. There is usually some sort of discussion. Yeah. It might be a back and forth. It might be someone needs a clarification, but I try as much as I can to treat everyone with respect and knowing that if they're asking questions, they're engaging with me it's because they want to learn. I think you have some coaches who, when asked questions, take it as a personal offense. Now, that is a coach who is not willing to engage in discussion because as soon as you ask them a question, they feel like you're attacking, they're attacking, they feel like you're attacking their method. They're right. very insecure about their knowledge and they just want to be seen as this all-knowing figure. Now, the moment you have that, you put yourself up there as this all-knowing figure who cannot be questioned. What you've done is you've stunted your client's growth because they can no longer engage with you. You've also stunted your own growth because you basically said, I've peaked. I can know nothing else. I've peaked. That's yeah. it. I'm done. You know, it's, you think about it, it's a consequence, isn't it? Yeah. So I would look for a coach who is able to exhibit signs of self-growth, no matter how old they are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like I'll give you this, Dan John, Dan John, the old um, American um, weightlifting coach. He still thinks about things and talks about things in an open, thoughtful manner. He still engages with people. Like, if you have a coach who is more of a angry father figure or tyrant who isn't willing to engage, who isn't willing to admit when they're wrong, mm. that is someone you should avoid like the absolute plague because that is an insight to how they'll coach you. They will coach mm. you with that same technique of just shouting at you and saying, do this. They are probably the type of coach who is going to say, here's my ideal client. And if you don't fit into that, <laughs> he's out of ideas. He's yeah. out of ideas. And that's not good. Like, you have to... I think some people who are, I think it boils down to this whole idea of people being either extrinsically or intrinsically motivated. And so mm. for somebody like, for, for guys like us, we are to a varying degrees intrinsically motivated. That's why we do YouTube. We talk about this kind of stuff. We are motivated to do so. It gives us pleasure to do so, right? Yeah. For a lot of people, they are extrinsically motivated. They need somebody else to be the drill sergeant. Now, okay. extrinsic motivation is motivation outside yourself. It would be like as a school teacher, you have to do this homework, otherwise you're going to get detention. It's an extrinsic motivator. Or if you go to college, you get paid. You know, you remember that thing in England a few years ago. So yeah. that's extrinsic motivation. Now, a lot of these people who have zero intrinsic motivation, they look at these shouty coaches because they are extrinsically motivated. They want someone to shout at them. They enjoy that. So when the coach is shouting at them, they think, okay, great, I'm getting motivated. This is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then they go and they realize that's all there is. There is nothing else. And as soon as you have one day where they have a bit of a day off the boil, they've not even begun to build any internal efficacy, any intrinsic motivation. So they go off the boil. So to look for a coach, you have to look for somebody who is at least a little bit thoughtful and is, has, has demonstrated an ability to create intrinsic motivation in you. Have they, do they have the ability to empower you with knowledge and yeah, with, with knowledge and a certain degree of internal motivation, or do they have to shout at you every day just to get you to eat your meals and go to the gym? That is not building intrinsic motivation. I yeah. I don't typically speak to my clients every day. That's, that would not be building any kind of intrinsic motivation. My end goal for all of my clients, and I say to all of them is, at some point, you're going to fly the nest. Like, mm -hmm. I want to leave you empowered and that is what ultimately builds a good experience with with students and with, with with clients and that empowers them so they have a good experience whereas if you have this sort of shouty angry motivational drill sergeant that won't result in a good experience because as soon as you go off the boil you will blame yourself you're like okay yeah. it was clearly my fault and then you'll go back to them and they'll shout at you again until the next time you fall off the, the bandwagon because you have no intrinsic motivation See, it, it's it's a trick. Those coaches, is, so it's a trick. Those coaches will trick you into thinking that's what you need. What you actually need is is not to be shouted at. What you actually need is to be able to do these things without the need for somebody shouting in your ear. Yeah. And that's harder. That's harder. What you want is you want the comfort of somebody shouting at you every single day, but that's not a livable thing for life. Sure. You know? 
like you, you Aon, you've, you've lost a bunch of weight since you were um, younger. Now, yeah. that takes a degree of intrinsic motivation, you know, like mm -hmm. that's great. So you have built up those habits, you built up that um, efficacy. It's you don't have somebody shouting at you every day. You do it yeah. yourself. It's for you. It's for your personal self-respect, whatever your whatever your thing is, right? Yeah. Now, so to get you to the next step, you need more of that. To get you to the next step, to get you bigger or leaner or whatever it is, right? We need more and different habits and get them ingrained and the support to do that. That is what you should be looking for in a coach. That is how you pick a good coach. You pick somebody who has demonstrated an ability to do that. You mm -hmm. do not pick somebody who, who sees themselves as this overly oppressive father figure tyrant type person who has to always be right run an absolute mile from somebody like that yeah okay that's a, a really complete answer <clears throat> and then the last question i had unfortunately it's the last question i wish i had a few more um but it's basically just what's next for for you for you in, in your um, in your endeavors, I mean, I know you've got you've got Fazlid, you've got YouTube. You mentioned you were doing running and other sports as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, what's next for yourself and and, um, and your clients as well? You would like to well, spend on that. I have I have a plan for the business. You know, I have a plan for business. I have a long term plan for the business. Um, and as I say, it doesn't necessarily rely on trying to be super famous on YouTube. I have other ways that I advertise my business, other services that I offer. Um, but I definitely have a plan for Koji. I don't plan on stopping Koji anytime soon. I really enjoy it. I feel like this is something I can do for a long time. Um, but yeah, my I guess my basic plan is now, now that I'm in my 40s and I have a pretty solid business setup um, and I'm comfortable, my plan is not to blink. You know? Yeah. Um, my plan is not to blink. My plan is to enjoy my life. I spent a lot of my 30s um, pushing for various as per my competitive personality, pushing for various things, whether they were financial or in my personal life or whatever, or, or athletic endeavors, my my goal right now is not to blink. And I think I've earned that. I've, I've earned yeah, that. So and that is, that's my goal is to ensure I'm enjoying my life. I'm living it. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that that's for, for me personally, that's it. I, I have a plan for the business, but for me personally, my plan is, yeah, don't blink. All the best for that, hopefully. Um, we still see you on YouTube and, you know, and keep sharing these stories and, and information. It does. It's helped the community a lot, I think. So it's probably not aware of it. I don't know. Obviously, when you're doing stuff yourself, you can't tell. Um, no. We've influenced the community quite quite a lot. So thank cool. you for that. And in terms of clients, anything new coming out for them? Um, any apps, any groups, anything? That's all you want to there plug There is, in? actually, yeah. You know, yeah, there is. You can yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll pin this out, actually, because there yeah. is. So um, starting from Monday, well, this is... We're recording this on the 19th of of May, starting yeah. from Monday, which is the 22nd. It is the launch of my coaching group. So I've wanted to offer a lower price point coaching option. So this is going to be a coaching option which is delivered in a group. It is at a much more attractive price. And you also benefit from there being a community. So it's a different branch of Faz Lifts. There is still <laughs> going to be the one-to-one -one option, like every coach does. And the one-to-one -one option is eventually, I think, going to be mostly reserved for people who want my private attention one-to-one. -one. But I would like to do the majority of my coaching within the coaching group because I think it's a much better means of accessing information. And you have, you will have access to a lot more in the way of check-ins, a lot more in the way of questions being answered, wisdom like this, all the kind of stuff that you, you want, which is going to help with your own intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Um, typically speaking, a one-to-one -one client will get one check-in, but... Um, with these group coaching, there'll be three check-ins across the week for the entire group. So there's always going to be some content. So I feel like it's a very, very good deal. And I'm able to offer it because it's in a coach setting. I'm able to offer it at a discount price. It's a very, very good competitive price. So if you're interested in coaching, check it out. Um, the prices are all on my website. You can throw me an inquiry via the links on my Instagram. Also, just there's a there's a contact form on my website as well. But just, just get in touch somehow. Just look Fazlift somewhere and get in touch wherever that is and we can we can talk about it yeah. perfect no, thank you so much again for your time this was like a dream collab for me so i really appreciate the time that you've given um and hopefully everyone's watching has learned a few things and um, enjoyed this conversation thank you so much for watching well, thank you for having me on it's always a pleasure thank Take you care.